Hello everybody, welcome to your fourth lecture on theatre and performance in context. I hope you're enjoying the module so far. This week we're going to go even further back than David's lecture from last week and ask how plays written for Greek audiences by the 5th century BCE remain relevant today, especially in a feminist context. Fiona McIntosh explains that Greek tragedy has enjoyed a vigorous afterlife on the modern stage, both in the original Greek and in translation. Yet while the production history of, say, Shakespeare has long been the subject of academic inquiry, it is only very recently that classical scholars have appreciated both the value and the importance of charting the fortunes of Greek drama in the modern period. You'll find in the lectures that I'm delivering on the module this year that I often return to questions of how and why canonical texts by writers such as Sophocles and Shakespeare have re been remixed, recontextualized, and reimagined for modern audiences. When I describe an author as canonical, I mean that their texts have accrued such a level of cultural significance and longevity that they now occupy a fixed position within society, whereby their work is unquestionably influential and offers their successors um, an artistic template. The plays of Greek tragedians um, such as Sophocles, Aeschylus and Euripides, Shakespeare's collected works and the novels of Jane Austen are just three such examples. However, I'd encourage you to, when engaging with texts such as these, push back against those notions of canonicity and automatic respect. Indeed, in his introduction to Robert Icke's 2015 adaptation of Aeschylus' trilogy, The Oresteia, Simon Goldhill concludes that the danger for any work when it becomes a classic is that it remains under aspic, an out-of-date dish admired out of duty. Aeschylus's Oresteia is undoubtedly one of the greatest works of Western culture, but it needs continual and active re-engagement with its immense potential to make it speak with its true insistence of power. All translators are traitors, but some traitors turn out to be liberators who let us recalibrate what matters and see the world from a startlingly new perspective. I invite you to uh, pause the video now for about two minutes and think about an example of a classical text which has rewired um, and been rewired in such a way that it has made you see the world from a fresh point of view. You might like to note this down and share it during your seminars. OK, if you're back, I shall continue. So, one of the reasons why plays like Antigone, Hamlet, Medea and Macbeth have endured is that successive generations of artists have not only been drawn to the narrative templates of familial and generational conflict, revenge and heroic journey, but have interrogated those texts and their perceived importance. This has resulted in playwrights repositioning plays from alternative, marginalised perspectives, such as Tom Stoppard's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, Tim Crouch's I Banquo, and, as I'll explore at the end of this lecture, Sunjay Kim's Riot Antigone. As David explored last week, our patriarchal society has long resulted in the exclusion of female voices. In literature, this has resulted in a greater proportion of those writers generally considered canonical being male, and it is this imbalance and the need to redress it which has resulted in some of the most exciting and engaging adaptations of the 20th and 21st centuries. To name just one prominent female author who has reclaimed male narratives and amplified the voice of a marginalised woman, Margaret Atwood has responded to both Shakespeare and the epic poet Homer in her short story Gertrude Talks Back, a riposte to Hamlet, and her novella The Penelope Ad, which explores the events of the Odyssey more acutely from the perspective of Odysseus's abandoned wife Penelope. Before we dive into Antigone and the two recent stage productions I've asked you to watch, I would like to dwell upon the surge in popularity of restaging Greek tragedies over the last decade. The middle of the 2010s was especially fruitful in terms of revivals spearheaded by well-known actors in lead roles. As you can see on your screens, in 2015, the Almeida Theatre announced its Greek season, which involved productions of the Bacchae, Medea and the Oresteia. This followed three prominent female performers delivering their interpretations of Greek tragic heroines, Juliette Binoche's Antigone, Kristen Scott Thomas's Electra, and Helen McCrory's Medea. This is something to keep in mind. People are endlessly fascinated with the casting and recasting of roles which 
seem to define how our society is engaging um, with change or remaining in a place of stasis. Discussions about who will be the next actor to play Hamlet, Batman, Bond and the Doctor. Um, these discussions abound. So these discussions will often centre around roles traditionally occupied by white men, although the recent castings of Kush Jumbo as Hamlet at the Young Vic, Lashana Lynch as the uh, first female 007 in No Time to Die, and Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor, suggest that the arts industry is taking baby steps towards diversifying canonical roles such as these. The Greek tragedies have arguably proved popular with actors and audiences seeking greater female representation in their classical theatre due to the abundance of strong, independently minded women whose motivations are not tethered to their male counterparts. By contrast, audiences might often find that women in Shakespearean tragedies like Hamlet and King Lear are underwritten, subservient to the motivations of male protagonists and receive comparatively less stage time. Certainly, female performers are less likely to re receive what I would call their Hamlet moment in a Shakespeare production in the, uh, the way the Cumberbatches and the Hiddlestons of this world have enjoyed. Macintosh suggests that every encounter with the past is really an exploration of current concerns and needs, and where is this better illustrated than through a study of the performance histories of Greek tragedies? In a society which rightfully demands greater equality and representation on stage and screen, directors and writers have thus turned to these ancient texts and their female characters to address our contemporary concerns about the abuse, discrimination and misrepresentation faced by women. Shakespeare may retain his place as one of the most revered and revived playwrights of the English language, but where some directors and writers find his plays either unsuitable for adaptation into contemporary language or see his gender politics as limiting and anachronistic, many turn to the Greek masters for inspiration. In her review of the Almeida's Medea, for instance, Susanna Clapp asked whether Homer has become our new Shakespeare. Are the ancients our new contemporaries? As the stage increasingly turns to classical Greek writers for echoes of our current torments, the most common resonance has often seemed vengeance, the locking of generations into feud. In a generation where the young appear increasingly disconnected from their elders and indeed each other through the gulf created by ever-developing technology, this prevalent theme seems increasingly relevant. By turning to the writers who predate and influence Shakespeare's interwoven narratives of extreme violence, cruelty, domestic tragedy and satirical farce, modern audiences are frequently exposed to the root of why these types of stories continue to fascinate our morbid sensibilities. In Ike's Oresteia, for instance, we are asked to sympathise with the murderous actions of Clytemnestra, wife to the Greek commander Agamemnon, who kills her husband in revenge for him sacrificing their daughter Iphigenia in order to further his military campaign during the Trojan War. Like Aeschylus before him, Ike drew on events either described or alluded to in Homer's epic poems The Iliad and The Odyssey in order to flesh out a backstory for Clytemnestra and provide his modern audience with a context for her actions. Unlike in the 11th book of the Odyssey, where the ghost of Agamemnon appears to Odysseus and recounts the tale of his wife's acts of murder and adultery with her lover Aegisthus, with no mention made of the sacrifice, Ike builds on Aeschylus' interpretation of the murder and adds to it, including metatheatrical scenes where Agamemnon and Clytemnestra's son Orestes speaks to a therapist about the actions of the play and faces up to the traumatic events which lead to his mother's murder of her husband and his murder of his mother and her lover. Alongside Antigone, Medea is a play which has enjoyed a particular revival in popularity prior to and in the wake of the hashtag MeToo movement. Mike Bartlett, Ben Power and Rachel Cusk updated the play for Headlong, the National Theatre and the Almeida respectively. While Power's version chose to keep the modern context ambiguous and aligned Medea, played by the late Helen McCrory, with Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth through the retention of her communication with Hecate and the spirits, Cusk eschewed such supernatural connotations and recast Medea as a 21st century writer who struggles to deal with life as a single mother since her actor husband Jason left her for a younger woman. In this way the aesthetic was more similar to Bartlett's 
which made the play's contemporary resonance almost cloyingly explicit through the bold design of a two-story house on stage and pop culture references scattered throughout the script. One of Medea's uh, many striking monologues uh, in Kuski's um, adaptation forces us to confront the very reason for Medea's continued popularity. And as Rupert Gould, who directed Kuski's Kusk's adaptation, notes, what is it about women who kill that so excites our dramatic heritage? Making clear reference to his previous experience of directing Fleetwood, pictured here as the aforementioned Lady Macbeth, who similarly declares her commitment to filicide. I have given suck, and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked the nipple from his boneless gums, and dashed the brains out, had I so sworn as you have done this. As, so, as you have done to this. As Medea enters its final stages, the audience's anticipation of the moment of murder grows. In any production of Medea, this is palpable and unavoidable. The publicity of Fleetwood as an inverted domestic goddess with a hand in a blender atop a chopping board with berries, in the other hand, screams with the dark glamour that Gould also references in his programme notes. Where Bartlett and Power chose to return to the play's potent power for violent awakening, giving the audience its cathartic climax and release of energy, Cust denied the audience this by depicting Fleetwood taking her children downstairs and then re-emerging to shovel dirt on top of the exit, whilst an androgynous messenger character recounts the actions from above. This received criticism from many reviewers, but I found this absence of violence to be far more chilling than an explicit display of it on stage. It is an old adage, but the best horror narratives have continually demonstrated over centuries that unseen violence is far more terrifying than blood and guts, forcing the audience to imagine the horrors just out of sight. Cusk's script performed a similar feat. She went further by turning this morbid fascination onto the audience itself in Medea's own words. I feel it your unhonoured truth, like a boulder on my back. It gives you a thrill to watch me suffer. The less I pretend, the more of a kick you get. I enact what you disown about yourselves. I take the punishment you've avoided. That's why you watch me. That's why you're here. I'm going to conclude um, this uh, section of the lecture by, uh, by asking uh, a question. Um, the second reason for this production of Medea's potency was its status as a female written adaptation. While Bartlett and Powers' respective versions were compelling, topical and poetic, Cusk seemed to climb inside Medea's complex psychology and as a result presented a three-dimensional character who drew our sympathy and pity much more than horror or incomprehension. Male writers have had a tendency to fetishise female figures of Medea's elemental power and it is thus refreshing to glimpse the character not as a femme fatale or a victim man-hater but as a wrong partner dealing with acute emotional distress and now for my question which you will see on your screens um, which is provided by Goldhill. Goldhill asks what was Greek tragedy for? What was its function for the society in which it first developed? And answers tragedy rewrote the inherited myths of ancient Athens for the new democratic city and performed them before the assembled citizens. Tragic drama produced a new and challenging repertoire of stories for the city to explore what civic life now meant. Another answer is that Greek tragedy was a space for its audience to gather where they might begin to understand and think about themselves. And when you return, we will start to ask these questions in relation to Antigone. Thank you.